All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I'm your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms, and you are catching us as we near the end of our epic Hope for Wildlife series. It has been a wild ride around the planet as we have been joined by some really fantastic scientists, educators, conservationists who are working to bring back species from the brink uh, across the world, partnering with all sorts of collaborators at universities, research institutions and more to help save some of the most iconic and amazing species on this planet. So this series is a conjunction between us, the amazing team at the IUCN's new green status of species designation, and the awesome resource folks at Conservation Optimism. They have made some of the best educational things we've ever had on these broadcasts, and I really encourage you to check out their Kids Corner when you're done with these programs. Now the last three programs have been very aquatic. We've gone to coral reefs, we've talked about sharks, we've been in all these amazing places in Indonesia and Madagascar and more. Well, we are going to change it up. We are going to go very far north, all the way up to Alaska, to be joined by Luke Rogers at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to talk about bison, which are not only an iconic animal for ecosystems, but for the culture of people across all of what we now know as North America, normally Turtle Island. So we've had the chance to feature a ton of bison programs, and I'm really excited today to dive away from Canada, where we typically feature them, to Alaska, and some really special stuff they've got on the go there. So without further ado, I'll stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Luke to join us uh, and share a little bit about his amazing story. Luke, thanks so much for joining us today, man. Hey there, Jesse. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the introduction. And thank you all for coming to listen to this today, uh, wherever you're all from. Uh, my name is Luke Raleigh Rogers. I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and I am a bison scientist. You're here with me at my office today, a little cluttered, but we have a lot of work going on. Um, well, first of all, I hope you're all having a good morning or afternoon, if it's that time where you're at. It's 9 a.m. here in Alaska right now, and this morning it was really chilly. It was a minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. For you in Canada, that would be minus 20 or other folks using the Celsius system. And a fun fact for you, um, minus 40 Fahrenheit is the same as minus 40 Celsius. So you can always use that with one of your neighbors if they use a different system than you do. <laughs> We've got winter full on here, uh, the beginning of November in Alaska. We've been having snow for the last couple of weeks and the snow that's falling right now is gonna stick around until probably April or late May. So it certainly is a cold winter here, but if you love it, you love it. And I'm one of those folks that loves it. <laughs> Well, I'm going to show a couple slides with you today and talk to you about bison and the work we do up here in Alaska. And I hope that you enjoy it and hold on to your pants, folks. I'm holding on to the pants. And I want to note, too, I forgot to mention in the intro, we are going to have a Kahoot today. So between Luke's presentation as he's pulling that up uh, and our Q&A bit, if you want to pull this up in a separate tab on your screen, lots of opportunity to have some fun and interactive bit in between. But Luke's got his presentation up, so I'm going to turn it back to him and can't wait to dive in with wood bison. Let's do it, man. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I will be talking to you about our wood bison restoration project up here in Alaska, which is run by Fish and Game, the state agency that manages our wildlife resources up here. Um, to start with, though, let's uh, figure out if we all have a good idea of where I'm at here. So this is a map of North America. I know as far as I can tell, most folks in the room here are from North America. So where would Fairbanks, Alaska be in your mind? Take a second to think about that. Is it somewhere down over here? No. Is it maybe over so. here? No, it's close to me though. <laughs> How about up here? Yeah, it seems well, about if you right. If it was up here, then you would be right. Right about where my cursor is right now is Fairbanks, Alaska. So we are the northernmost city in the United States and the coldest most city in the United States. So you really gotta love winter to be up here. Um, up here in Alaska versus some places like in Canada or California or other spots in the lower states of the United States, we have a lot of wilderness. And to put that in perspective, think about your local park that you have. Maybe it's a couple blocks in the middle of the city, but in that park, you don't have any development other than maybe a bench or two. Well, imagine that park times a thousand times 10,000 sizes. That's what most of Alaska is like. There's no park benches. There's no sidewalks. There's no people. There's no structures. It's just vast wilderness with very few people on it. And to also put that in perspective, in this entire state we have up here, there are only 750,000 people. 
if you're somewhere like Edmonton, Alberta or Los Angeles, that's multiple times what we have in our entire state in that one city. So there's not a lot of people up here, but there's a lot of wilderness and a lot of wildlife. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is what is a wood bison? Well, this is a wood bison right here. You're looking at a nice big old bull wood bison that we have up here in Alaska. And I even have with me here the hide of a wood bison. And you can see just how big and fluffy he is. He's really got a lot on him. This would be the mane on the top of his head. And it is certainly soft. If you were to make a nice big old jacket out of this or something, it'd be very warm and fluffy. Another thing that you might like to see is a big old bison skull. Oh, look at that. Here we have it right here. This is a big old bison bull as well. You can see his horns right here. These are his eyes. This would be his big old snout. And you can see on the bottom there, there's his teeth. This thing's pretty heavy. I think you might have a little bit of a struggle lifting it up because he's a big boy. <laughs> Very cool. So that is a wood bison for you. <clears throat> and where did these wood bison come from? Well, first of all, here is our wood bison range in Alaska. We've got a bison herd in the wild right over here in this red dot. The rest of this area that you're looking at is the historic range where we used to have bison in um, up to about 100 years ago, we had bison in Alaska and then they disappeared. But luckily, the project that we're doing right now is bringing back those bison and restoring them to the wild and bringing back their wildness here in Alaska, which is amazing because there's no other wood bison in the United States. If you're tuning in from Canada, though, you probably have heard that you got tons of bison. And in fact, all the bison we have here, they came from Canada right near Elk Island National Park by Edmonton, Alberta. So if you're in Edmonton or Alberta, your local bison came all the way up here to Alaska to help us establish our bison herds. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. <clears throat> um, our bison herd way over here, again, this little red dot, it's over four hours from the nearest road system. You can't drive there. You can't take a boat there. You have to fly there for four hours from our local cities to get there. So it is way out there in the remote wilderness. It's pretty cool, though, I got to say. I spent six weeks there this summer, and it was the best time of my life. So how do we get those bison there? Well, we have to transport them via multiple methods. You'll see up here in the top left, we've got shipping containers on top of a big rig truck. This is how they came from Edmonton, Alberta, all the way up to Fairbanks, Alaska, where I'm from. We loaded them into these shipping containers that we specially made to hold the bison and take good care of them. And then we brought them all the way up a 36 hour drive nonstop just to get them here as fast as possible. But like I said before, you can't drive these bison out into the wilderness where they are. So we have to do some crazy different methods down here on the bottom. This is those bison containers getting loaded into a C-130 Hercules, a military style jet to fly them over there, which is pretty wild. And then the other method you can do is you can take them on a big old barge like this and bring them down the Yukon River, the third largest river in the United States for us here, and bring them all the way down the Yukon and let them off close to where the rest of the bison herd is. And here's a picture of that. This is me flying over those bison this summer when we released some. It was a pretty cool time. It takes about 600 miles. So I think that's somewhere in the realm of 1,000 to 1,200 kilometers to get them from Fairbanks all the way over there. So our state is really big and it takes a long time to get them where they need to be. Once we get them there, we put them in what is called a soft release pen. So this is the work I was doing this summer. You can see this is me right over here. I'm building this pen in the background made out of makeshift fence and poles that we cut from trees with these local folks from the villages nearby. There's a lot of Alaska native villages in the region, such as Grayling, Anvik, Shagaluk, and Holy Cross. 
And these folks here all come a, from a native village called Holy Cross. And they came out to the uh, soft release site is what we call it, where we hold these bison for a short period of time to let them adjust to their new habitat. And to put that in perspective for you, it's kind of like, have you ever been on a really long plane ride or a really long bus ride? And as soon as you can get off the bus or plane, you just want to run. You just want to stretch your legs out. You are so tired of sitting down for such a long time. Well, it's the same thing for these bison that are hanging out in these tight containers. Unfortunately, though, if they if we let them just do that, they might run far away and never come back together, never establish that herd that we want them to. So what we always try to do is put them in these things that are called soft release pens. They're just short makeshift fences that we make to hold the bison so that they can still stretch themselves out and relax a little bit from their long, stressful journey, but not run so far away that they never group up again. So I was super fortunate to have this great crew of workers help build this fence with me this summer. We spent about 10 days building it, and it was just the time of my life. At the same time, we were looking at the local bison that were already out there. So this is one of those local bull bison that as I was just driving a little jet boat down the river, he just poked his head out and said, hello, Luke, how are you doing today? And I said, I'm doing great. How are you doing? It was a pretty cool experience. <clears throat> and so just so I can clarify again, if you didn't already catch that, we have brought multiple groups of bison out there. So the first group of bison we released out into this area called the Yukon Inoko area uh, was 130 bison that we took both by plane and by boat over to this area. Then again, this summer, seven years later, we brought an extra 30 yearling bison that we got all of these from Elk Island National Park, thanks Canadians, and brought them by barge and held them in this soft release pen. We then let them interact with the local bison, like this bull you see here, who'd come up to the fence and he'd look at these little guys. He said, hey, I don't recognize you. Where are you from? And they'd be like, I don't recognize you, but you seem pretty cool. Kind of like a big brother situation. And we'd watch them do bison see, bison do, as in this bull would eat some grass. And then one of the yearlings on the other side of the fence would be like, hey, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to eat some grass too. So they're really learning and they're a very social animal. So to watch them interact like that and teach each other these strategies is just so cool to watch. Um, it was a really good opportunity. Anyways, that's the soft release site that we built this summer. And we held bison in it for about two weeks until we released them out to join the rest of the herd, where there's no fences and they can go wherever they want at that point. They really have the freedom to choose whatever they want to do. And to put that into another view, I know people love to see videos, so let's look at some videos. I'm going to just pull them up here if I can. Oh, you can. So far, so good. And we're ripping through this, so we got tons of time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, here's what it looked like in 2015 when we had the bison in the soft release pen. You can see they're just kind of hanging out there, relaxing, enjoying their environment. In the background there, you can see that orange fencing. That's that soft release pen that I was talking about. So at the moment, they're not free to leave, but we're just letting them relax. And you can already tell that they're starting to relax there. None of them look like they're running around too much, getting too wild. And so once we can tell for sure that that's the case, then it's time to release them. So here's kind of that first step to that. This is my boss. His name's Tom Seaton. He's the project biologist. He's running a snow machine, as we call them up here, but I also hear people call them snow goes or snowmobiles or sleds. And he is leading the bison uh, via a couple different methods. But uh, mainly you can see he's got a bag of cubes there, which is their favorite food. It's like a treat. And he's putting them down on the ground there, and then they are going to follow along. And you'll see in just a second here. Here they come. They're like, oh, you got candy for me there. <laughs> That's like me on Halloween when uh, my wife came home with the chocolates. <laughs> exactly, Jesse. And there you go. All of those buffalo or bison, as we use in science terms, 
are just running along and following my boss, Tom, on his snow machine. And then to watch the final release, and this is after they've been in that soft release pen for a while, so you can see the end of it here. He is leading them out to their final release location where they're no longer going to be in a pen anymore, and they can do whatever they want. Must have been a pretty cool experience for him to be driving the snow machine like that. Oh, look at that. And you'll see here even that he's basically going as fast as the as his snow machine can go. <laughs> and these bison are still catching up to him. And you'll see here in a second that they start to weave back and forth. And that's kind of their method to slow down a little bit. And even then, he had to really go as fast as possible. So now you can see they kind of weave back and forth a little bit to take up a little bit more room. This is both amazing. I've never seen anything quite like this and also vaguely terrifying. Like it's like <laughs> they're, they're right there. Oh, look at that. Absolutely. Wow. So we've got just about a minute more on that and then I'll just wrap it up with a couple other cool little points. But, you know, these are the kind of things that we live for. And the, the reason why we do this work is for these kinds of experiences here. And, um, Tom had a pretty good opportunity with this initial release in 2015 to release these bison this way. And this summer I had a similar experience when we released the yearlings in the summer. So Luke, you have to promise us if you ever do this again and you want to be like live on camera, I'm sure we could get like a hundred classes to watch this live with the camera from the back of the snow Oh machine. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet we can make it happen. Okay. <laughs> you have my number. <laughs> All right, and there they go. This is the final stretch here where there's no longer any fence to contain them and they're free to do whatever they want now. So this is kind of that final moment of bison being restored to the Alaska wild for the first time being in the wilderness in a hundred years. Pretty special moment. Go back to here real quick. Well, what do we do now that we have bison in the wild? Well, we monitor them. So what you're seeing here is me on the right side and my boss, Tom Seaton on the left and a big old cow bison in front of us, cow being a female bison and a helicopter in the back. So every couple of years we go out and we capture some of these bison. So this bison is just gently fallen asleep. As soon as we're done here, we're gonna wake it back up and it'll go along doing its normal bison business but we are just monitoring it and we are taking care of it in that we give it vitamins and minerals. We check to see if it's pregnant, if it has any parasites or anything like that. And we put on what's called a radio collar on it. So here's an idea of what that radio collar looks like. You can see it down here. And I've got a couple different versions of them here with me. Here's a radio collar that you would use for a really little guy and it stretches. Here's a radio collar that you'd use, like the ones we used this summer on the yearlings. It also stretches, but it's a little bit stronger. This is a radio collar for a cow bison, an adult female bison. And then the really crazy big ones. This is the radio collar for an adult bull. And I'm a fairly skinny guy, but this would be a huge belt if you wanted to put it on there. <laughs> Look at that. Very cool, man. You have, the, you have the best props up there. He's the series so far, you have the best props. I just want you to know that. Right? <laughs> Excellent. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, so, yeah, we're at this phase now where we're trying to monitor the bison we already have out there. And we're working to establish bison in new areas wherever folks would like to have them. And it's really a great opportunity. This is something that I've been working for since I was a little kid. And uh, I'm just so happy to be doing what I'm very passionate and I love to do. And so with that, 
I know I hit my 20 minute mark right on the dot there. So perfect timing. And uh, thank you so much for listening. I look forward to playing some Kahoot with you and uh, answering any questions after that. Luke, that was a spectacular presentation, man. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and as you said, we're going to dive in with our Kahoot. So four quick questions to test your understanding, play along with some things that Luke talked about that you can also find in those amazing Kids Corner resources. Uh, for anyone who's new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get, and you don't win anything, but you do win Luke and I's everlasting respect. So feel free to join in. I know we've got some classes already queued in, which is fantastic. Any individual students with devices, you're welcome to join in too. Uh, and we're gonna get underway. Now, Luke, you can help us out with, uh, uh, I guess, assistance at the five second mark for each of these questions. But we are gonna go live and start now, and anyone can join after we start soon as well. All right, three, two, one for our first question. True or false? American bison is the largest land animal in the Western Hemisphere. So west of our, our think guy in the middle. So not including Africa, not including Asia. We're not competing with elephants. But on this side, North and South America, are they the biggest? What do we think? Da, 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 da. I mean, what's his competition? He's got polar bears, maybe. He's mm -hmm. got, you know, big horses. He's got, but it is correct. They are the biggest land, which is for anyone who's ever had a chance to see a bison, either in the wild, hopefully, or in a zoo, they are really quite an incredible animal. I, I've I've been to a place uh, which will I'm not going to spoil because we're going to it next in our thing. <laughs> Amazon Chicken has our lead right now. Way to go! Let's dive with question number two. So, wood bison are being introduced to Alaska from which national park population? This is where I've had the chance to go in person, and it's a really special place. Uh, is it Banff? Jasper, Yellowstone, or Elk Island. Now, all of these are special places. Absolutely. One of them has our, our sort of seed population of bison that incidentally has helped seed some of the other bison populations in other of these parks. What's our answer here? You guys were like on the ball. Elk nice. Island is correct. So just about a, a, an hour or so east of Edmonton, I would say, something like that. It's a really special place. And they're, they're right on the side of the road. I mean, you're driving along and they're right there. It's spectacular. Uh, Amazon Chicken takes our lead. Okay, we're going to go in with question number three. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat and get your own questions ready for Luke in a minute. But I wanted to highlight this. Communities were consulted before the bison reintroduction. True or false? So community conservation in general has been a big theme of our Hope for Wildlife series and is a big part of what we do generally. So what do we think? When we were reintroducing the bison, did we talk to anybody or did we just do it? We just put them out there and hope for the best. 23 of you now, way to go guys. All right, and the answer is, so a mixed, you guys were mixing this. True, so Luke, why is it so important to consult with communities before introducing the bison? Yeah, absolutely, that's a great question, Jesse. Um, first of all, it's really important that you have community involvement because this is their backyard, a lot of the local communities, and for them not to know that there's a giant bison in their backyard and to, to just happen across it. You know, that would be pretty startling. I, I'd imagine you guys would feel the same if you just looked out your backyard and there was a bison standing there. Yep. On the second hand, um, they're the stewards of the lands nearby them and they take care of the wildlife and the lands around them. So to give them that buy-in really gives them the opportunity to be involved with the process and feel like they have a responsibility for the animal as well. And that really helps them flourish. Yeah, that was a, a beautiful answer. And again, one of the things that we find, and it's so intuitive, but people didn't think this way for such a long period of time. When people are vested in their own local wildlife, they will work to protect it, to be the stewards of it, to make sure that it thrives. And so it's really essential that everyone gets on board when it comes to things, especially like reintroductions, which are very, uh, a big deal. You know, bison in my backyard is a big surprise. Um, <laughs> let's go to question number four, our final true or false. Bison are being reintroduced all over North America. Now, this doesn't mean Toronto in the heart of LA and New York City, but in multiple places outside of Alaska, what do we think? Is it just the Fairbanks population? Is it just them or are there other places that we're reintroducing? And if you've been paying attention to this Kahoot, you might even have a hint for this answer. Uh, what do we think? One more second, 27 answers in. And here we go. It's true. Yes. Yeah, so Banff National Park is classically who we've had on this broadcast talking about their bison reintroduction program and how wonderful it's been. Uh, but this has been a really special opportunity to hear about the Alaska population and Luke's awesome work. So here's our podium. Third place, Fast Yak. Good name for a, a as we do this Arctic program. Dr. Possum number two. And our winner for all the marbles, and let us know who you are before we dive into the questions, is Amazon Chicken. All right. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Way to go, guys. Um, so we're going to dive in with questions now. Madam Stephanie, Mr. H's class, if you guys want to turn on your devices and come on in, I can bring you into the broadcast. Anyone joining us live on YouTube, you're welcome to share any queries you have there as well. We'd love to take as many as possible. But I'll start with one of my own. So, Luke, how did you, I mean, you, you talked about being in Fairbanks, loving the winter. Is that the impetus for bison? Do you have a family connection with this? Did you do something in school that really put you on these amazing creatures? Or how did you get so involved, invested with them? That's a great question, Jesse. And to be honest, it's kind of a little bit of each of those. So I was born and raised here in Fairbanks. So I've always enjoyed the cold winters as it's what I've always known. Um, but like you said, my dad was involved with this project as I was growing up. So for you kids out there that are watching this project, while I was your age, my dad was working on this project and really trying to make bison a part of our ecosystem up here in Alaska. And so that really inspired me to get involved as well. And when I started college, I was given the opportunity to be a part of that initial release, kind of continuing the work that my dad did. And that really brought me a lot of uh, joy to do. So it really is a combination of all those things. And once you spend some time around bison, you just really realize that they are a special animal and it's such a joy to be around them. So I always look forward to it. That is a beautiful story, Luke. Thank you so much for sharing that, man. Um, Madam Stephanie's class, you guys are at the camera. Unmute your mic, come on in and ask away. Hey guys. No, oh, yes, you're almost good. We just need the mic unmuted. There we are. Oh, no, you had it unmuted, and then you muted it again. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Oh, we're really delayed. You guys have like a serious, serious. Oh. <laughs> so, Madam Stephanie, what I'm going to have you do is type in the chat. Your internet connection so slow that you actually can't get in a question. It chops it up too much. So, send it to me in the chat. Mr. H2, if you want to turn your devices on or send it in the chat, we can take them that way. While we're waiting for you to do that, Luke, we've talked about some of these other amazing places that bison are being reintroduced or sourced from. Do you go to these sites and visit them? Are you part of that part of the process too? Or are you solely in Alaska doing the work that you do? Sure. So I actually just completed my master's degree and I went down to Nebraska for that. The first time ever leaving my home state here in Alaska to live somewhere else. And I got to experience all the different bison herds in all these different areas. And that was a major part of my research was seeing how bison are managed and the situations that they live in throughout the world. Because bison don't exist just up here in Alaska. They exist into Canada, all the way down into the lower 48 United States and all the way into northern mexico so they really have a wide range of habitats spectacular uh and i'm so happy you had the chance to go to nebraska it's a special part of the world and i, I hope you come to alberta and hang out with us sometime where we got some good stuff going on up here oh, yeah. um let's head to madam stephanie um with the, have the bison ever escaped the perimeter like when you're i guess channeling them or in mm -hmm. general how do you keep them where you want them to be sure that's a great question and thank you for giving me that one uh, you can tell that those are some big animals and they are powerful animals. So if they wanted to charge down a fence, you couldn't build a fence strong enough to hold them in. Luckily, though, we use some tricks like that orange fencing, which has no strength to it, but it's a really big visual barrier. And they see that visual barrier and they decide, you know what, I'm not going to test that fence there. I am going to just move around it. So we have never had a bison break out of one of the perimeters that we've set up in our soft release pen. And we have been lucky in that it hasn't happened through our understanding of bison behavior and biology and the fact that they respect visual barriers like that. Thanks again for the question. Yeah, so I've had the chance to go to Saskatchewan before and they talk about the, when they used to hunt bison, people used to hunt them and drive them off cliffs and sort of setting up a bunch of people with blankets and having this big visual stimulus. The bison could walk right over a person, but when you have that jarring thing, they won't cross it and they go exactly where you want them to go. So we've used some of that knowledge for thousands of years now, which is really, really exciting. Um, Mr. H's class wants to know, do you name the bison? Any, any, is there Fred the bison that there or not? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you for that one, Mr. H. Uh, up here, the bison that we have, we don't have an official name for them, but I certainly name each one of them that I spend time with on my own. Um, we do have a wildlife conservation center down by our largest city, Anchorage. And those bison have been staying there for a longer time period. So they do actually each have names. And every year they have a little, um, 
event where they have folks decide what the category of the names for all the new calves are going to be. Is it going to be gemstones? Is it going to be U.S. states? Is it going to be colors? Those kinds of things. So you can always participate on that if you ever want to. So uh, just as a note for our students too, Alaska seems to do uh, sort of getting people involved with wildlife and conservation things better than any place in the world that I know of. Uh, some of our students might know about the Fat Bear Week or Fat Bear Contest mm -hmm. in Canada National Park. So the idea that there could be an opal the bison because people chose gemstones is truly amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of the biology, one of our classes that's having trouble getting into YouTube emailed me a question. So they want to know, are there any predators for them or threats? Once you release these bison, they're a huge animal. There's a bunch of them. Is there anything that's dangerous to them once they're out in the wild, really, or not? Sure, yeah. Um, bison do have predators. We have both wolves and bears and foxes and coyotes in our environment. However, bison are so big and they have a very big herd defense where they circle their young and defend them, um, that really there is not a lot of predation. We've had only a few instances of wolf predation since they were established. The bigger consequence we have for our bison here is those harsh winters. And bison use their head to move snow back and forth to access the grass and sedge that they eat. And sometimes we have icing events and then snow on top of that. And that makes it hard for those bison to get down there. So we find that that is actually the more pressing concern for our bison populations than predators. Yeah. Great question again. I'm glad you mentioned the circle sort of protection thing. So mm -hmm. this is something we see in muskox too, but uh, you know, 20, 30 gigantic animals that form a protective ring around their young is got to be one of the most intimidating sights in all of nature. And it's just been spe captured spectacularly a few times in documentaries if, if people haven't had the chance to see it. Absolutely. Um, so Madam Stephanie wants to know, uh, which is my question, uh, your colleague, uh, were they terrified on the snowmobile with the bison behind them? Like, or just very ca blase, casual, this is uh, all in the day's work sort of thing. <laughs> That's a funny one, you know? And uh, to be honest, when I talked with my supervisor, Tom Seaton, who was the gentleman on the snowmobile there, he wasn't even expecting this to go down the way it did. <laughs> he was putting out those cubes there, and you saw that that was like the bait to have the bison follow him. He thought, if anything, they would gently mosey on down the way, and he wouldn't be leading them at all, really. But in fact, the opposite happened, and they just started running full speed at him, and he couldn't go fast enough to get away from him. So he certainly was a little bit worried about it, but... Luckily, the bison were smart enough not to run him over and started weaving back and forth, like I said, and he got through it, no problem. That is good to hear. There's this moment where, like, he looks, I don't know if it's a hat, I think it's probably a helmet that he, like, rips on his head when they get pretty close, but that was like, wow, overdue, there you go. <laughs> oh, gosh, uh, the, the perils of conservation sometimes, but what a, a special thing. Honestly, I don't know if there's anything quite so rewarding in the world of conservation as reintroducing something and seeing them end up back in the wild. I mean, I, I'm grinning ear to ear just thinking about it. I've never been involved in one. And so what a lucky opportunity to do some really cool science in an amazing area with such a, a positive and tangible thing that you can see come to fruition. Very, very cool, Luke. Um, you started your program with this, <laughs> talking about Alaska's wilderness and the fact that like a huge proportion of that state is just wilderness wild. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for bison, how do you find them? Now, the groups that you have, you have the GPS collars on so you can track them. If yeah. people are looking for wild bison anywhere, is there a trick to that? Like, do you have any idea where they go or are you just winging it sort of the helicopter? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I will say that those radio collars that we put on them, they show us the exact location of those animals. And that is critical for getting there. Um, to find them because there is so much land and right now there's relatively few bison that it would be pretty difficult to find them on your own time. You'd be spending a lot of time and money to get out there. It's expensive to go out there and to see them. Um, so we are using those radio callers, but you know, the hope is that eventually there'll be enough bison throughout Alaska that it could be even the case like in Canada in some locations where there's bison near the road system that just peek out every once in a while and you'll be able to see them on just kind of your daily commute into town or something like that. Um, so we're hoping in the future that it will be more accessible to the general public. But at the moment, they're pretty far out there and they're pretty hard to find. Well, in the future, I certainly hope we get that case, uh, whether it's in our lifetimes or our kids' lifetimes, as we were talking mm -hmm. about before.
the broadcast. Uh, and with work like yours, I, I certainly think we're well on our path to doing just that. So it's very exciting times in conservation. Uh, we're going to take just a couple more questions. Time flies and you're having fun, Luke. So one from YouTube, uh, Ms. Milinovic, Milinkovic's class wants to know, why are bison endangered? So in general, what's the, the backstory on this? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Um, one thing I should say is that there are two different subspecies of bison, and that influences a little bit. Uh, you might be familiar with the bison in Yellowstone or the Great Plains. Those are called plains bison. And there are many, many more of those than there are wood bison. Wood bison were always a much smaller population that only existed in northern Canada and Alaska, north of Edmonton, Alberta area. Um, and plains bison were much more numerous down below. It's hard to say exactly why the decline was so strong, but we believe it had to do a little bit with the climate changing and making their habitat into smaller isolated pockets of grasslands instead of a wide, vast grassland. That accompanied with the introduction of modern firearms to the areas, uh, ended up with overhunting of the populations and rapid decreases of them. Um, at the moment though, they are on a trend to be delisted, um, which is great news. And you know, we're making work happen and uh, throughout these next couple decades and potentially centuries, we hope that they will no longer be an endangered species. So let's put it this way. When we were coming up with Hope for Wildlife, this is a series I've long wanted to bring to Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants. The very first species that I was essential to being a part of this was bison. They really are the sort of fundamental story of something that was previously insanely abundant. There were bison all over North America and dwindled down to a population that we really did think they were likely to go extinct. And we've been bringing them back so successfully lately that we can reintroduce populations of them to new areas in Alaska and Alberta and more. So it's a really special time in bison conservation and, and sort of it embodies everything that we like to share in terms of conservation, community led conservation, partnerships across countries and regions and nations. Uh, it's just a, a fantastic story in general. I really encourage our kids to learn more. And you had shared before the broadcast too, uh, this is a bit of an unwieldy URL, but I'll put it in the chat for everybody too. Uh, so our live classes and our YouTube classes can check out a little bit more about the Alaska Department of Fish and Games bison fact sheet information more. And of course, you can go to our kids corner on conservation optimism to learn even more and play along with some cool bison stuff when you're done as well. Luke, uh, before we wrap up, one final question from Madam Stephanie's class. Uh, in terms of the bison being hunted, what was it for? Fur, jewelry? Like, was there any trinket people were getting from it or, or just hunting for sport? Excellent question. And um, it kind of depends on who you're talking about that hunted them. But I'll speak generally about historical hunting of bison up here in Alaska. And that was basically every single part of a bison had a function and a purpose, um, which is amazing that no part of the animal was really wasted historically when there was hunting of bison. You know, you would use the hide to create some clothing to keep you warm in the cold winter months here in Alaska. You would use the meat to eat and have subsistence for your whole winter and you, probably your whole year. One bison can feed a family of four for a year or more. And you would use the bones for tools. You would use the horns for tools. You would use parts of their um, digestive tract to create ornamentals and jewelry um, and just so many other things. Every single part of the bison had a function and there's even a cool graphic that just shows how many different things could be made from every part of a bison. They really did have a really important purpose for the well-being and livelihood of folks up here historically. Yeah, it's quite, I, I don't think there's any individual animal species on this planet that I can really think of, uh, and certainly not featured in this broadcast series, that is so tied to a culture, a people, a region of the planet than bison. They really were the essential uh, organism or, or sort of they, they were thought of as so much more than that it's it's hard to really put into words uh except to have an indigenous community member come on and talk about that for thousands and thousands of years and i'm really glad you mentioned the hunting bit so i will confess you know 10 years ago if you asked me about hunting i would have said universally bad and you know what the as you learn more about conservation and how people engage with wildlife and utilize it and feel about it uh hunting done sustainably done well can be a huge boon for conservation it 
makes people value the animal, value the area so much more. Billions of dollars are put every year into the conservation of wildlife because of hunting. The key is to always not over harvest or not kill something just for the sake of killing it. And that's a, a thing with humanity just generally. So I think it's really a, an important message to share with kids that groups like the Alaska Department of Fish and Game do tremendous work to save wildlife, even when and how they support and coordinate with hunters and fishers. So that's a very important message of the program. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, that was a great point, Jesse. I think you really nailed it on the head there. And like the bottom line for me that I like to say is that by hunting these animals, it's because people really love and cherish them and value them. And they are such an important part of their livelihood. So just keep that in mind. Absolutely. Uh, Luke, this has been such a special time. Uh, we're almost done our broadcast. What I want to make sure again is that kids have the resources to keep the learning going. Again, it's on the bottom of my screen. It's in all our chats. If you want to learn more about bison from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, do check that out. Uh, Luke did an awesome interview with the Conservation Optimism team. So you can check that out, play some games, learn a lot more about bison at their Kids Corner on their website. And of course, if you want to check out this program or any of the others in our series, head to our YouTube channel here or specifically our wildlife series to see all the other programs in the series. Luke, you look like you have something to share with us too before we wrap up. So yeah. I have to highlight that. <laughs> True. And thank you all again for taking the time to be a part of this. Thank you, Jesse, for giving me this opportunity. We really are super appreciative of your participation and we love to share our story up here in Alaska. We're a small team. There's only two folks that are working on this full time. Um, but if you all want to learn more as well about our Alaska specific, we actually have an entire wood bison curriculum, a teacher's guide that you can get from us. Um, and Jesse could provide the contact information for me. And we would be happy to share this with you. And you could do a whole lesson plan teachers on wood bison uh, in Alaska. And it's applicable to other spots too. Even though it's Alaska wood bison, you could use it for Canada, California, Oregon, anything like that. And it has so many valuable lessons about bison in it. Very, very cool. How neat is that, man? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that after the fact. We'll make sure teachers have the opportunity to, to get in touch if they want to chime in with that. Uh, but Luke, this has been just a special opportunity. Thank you so much, man. Someone turned out the lights on you. <laughs> <laughs> Your other colleague, just looking it up. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up the broadcast there. Just say a big thank you to you and uh, encourage all our classes to keep learning going. Bye for now, Luke. Thanks, man. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you.